like to welcome everyone to the even more stories from the secret city. Uh, we still have some joining us, but we're happy to have you here. Happy to have you here with us this morning. Uh, let me begin by reminding us of how we want to be successful today. Uh, we really want your questions and we'd want you to ask those questions. So I'll stop sharing my screen periodically so we can do that. And uh, if I, I think I have everyone muted now, except for Mike Salo and myself, Mike is our guest with us this morning and I'll be introducing him in just a few minutes. But uh, keep, keep your microphone muted so we don't get feedback or we don't get extraneous noise. Uh, you can use the speaker view to see a large image of the person speaking. And you can also move the two images by just clicking on the line between us if you want a larger view of the, of the slide or a larger view of the person. Use the gallery view to see all of us and use chat. I'll try to monitor the chat as well if you... Uh, uh, want to ask a question or to send me one something privately. And then alternately, of course, is just unmute yourself and speak up. And either Mike or me, either one, will be glad to stop and, and ask, answer your questions as we're going along. There were two, two slides that I didn't get to show that I intended to last time. And as we were wrapping up, we, uh, uh, we left these two out. So I'm going to include them and then we'll bring Mike on. Uh, this is the first one, and it is a, an image, an artist image of the Wilson Street area uh, near the American Museum of Science and Energy, and the idea to bring a downtown area for Oak Ridge that has uh, uh, convenient for walking and has restaurants and apartments and, and retail as well. One of the intersections that they have in mind is, uh, is shown here, uh, the intersection with Main Street. Now, uh, this, this is a project, of course, that is just, uh, just being promoted now, one that uh, have, we have high hopes for, uh, to bring more uh, of a downtown, a real downtown area to, uh, to that part of the city. So I just wanted you to see that and be aware of it. Now, I'm gonna bring uh, Mike Stallo on. Mike is with the Oak Ridge Public Library. He's a reference librarian and uh, a good friend. He and I have worked together on many projects and he's my go-to person when I get something from an email or a contact by phone where people are looking for folks who lived here early on during the Manhattan Project and, and the early years of Oak Ridge. So I'm going to let uh, Mike come on. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and we'll let him come on and share his screen. And, uh, and we'll enjoy visiting with Mike for a bit this morning. Okay, Mike, you got it. Okay, Ray. Um, well, I see... Of course, I'm so used to doing these go-tos. So here in a minute, I will share my screen and we'll hope it goes smoothly. Uh, <laughs> I've got a few slides. Um, I was going to start off with um, some stuff that isn't some, some books that are new to the library that are, uh, you know, Oak Ridge related or Manhattan Project related. So let's see about sharing my screen. Okay, so we see Klaus Fuchs over there on the left. And that's not a, that's not a brand new book, but we did get that one. Uh, came out in May of 2020. I think we got it in uh, over the summer. And of course, although Fuchs was never here, you know, he does, he was our, you know, I guess the most prominent of the, of the Russian spies or spies for Russia. Um, so this one, you know, being that it's newer, there's been several books written on Klaus Fuchs, of course, but this one tells a little bit more backstory, a little bit more of, you know, how he got to where, he was, and, and then I guess after he was caught and, and just chronicles his life with a little more detail than the, <clears throat> some of the previous ones. It pulls from, from some of the previous ones. So it's, it's a good one. The other one is a brand new book just released in the last couple of months. And it does have ties to Oak Ridge. Um, George Koval, who was another spy, um, 
Koval, he was from Iowa. He, he ended up as, he's a chemical engineer. Uh, and also he worked in an electrical, sort of electrical engineering as well. And he worked at X10 in health physics. Um, and then basically in 2007, Koval was sort of an unknown until he was awarded, uh, the, you know, Vladimir Putin awarded him the highest hero of Russian, you know, medal, their civilian honor, highest civilian honor um, for his missions, spying. And so then, you know, looking at released files and it caused this big, you know, investigation and stuff. So his story has has been, you know, batted around. And now um, Anne Hagedorn did a great job researching this book um, very thoroughly. And, and there's a lot about his, you know, time in Oak Ridge and, and other places. So she was going to come for a book signing, uh, I guess in September, but COVID kind of put the kibosh on it and hopefully she'll reschedule. Talked about actually, November. Actually, Mike, she is mm -hmm. being, uh, she's being selected for our lunch for literacy speaker in 2022. Now, that in March. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we're, uh -huh. we're working with her now to, uh, to schedule, to get her here uh, in March of next year. Okay. Yeah, good. I, I, I know they tried to reschedule or tentatively reschedule in November, you know, for the book signing, but I guess they, I, I don't think they really have anything solid. So that's probably that maybe the first, first opportunity we get to, to see her. Um, let's see. Okay. And, and uh, kind of moving on, as I often mention, newspapers are my, are my favorite source and really one of the best sources, I think, for learning, you know, detailed historic information. Um, and so the stories I'm going to share with you, just a few, you know, a few brief stories I'm going to touch on are, for the most part, originally discovered in, in, in newspapers and, and not just Oak Ridgers or Oak Ridge newspapers, but sometimes even national. Um, I, I read the New York Times historical papers a lot and some of the regional papers, the, and of course the Sentinel and the, and the, and the Journal from Knoxville. Um, so this one was one. I guess it was probably six or seven years ago, maybe even eight or nine years ago, doing my routine Friday newspaper readings I would do when I still work uh, with my DOE job. When I was off, I would go to the library and I saw this headline, basically the one on the right that says Carpenter uh, bound to jury for murder. So this took place in, in Happy Valley right across from K-25. And this was, uh, you know, just shortly after the bomb was dropped, they were still working, uh, you know, there's still some construction work going on with, with K-27 and with, you know, various places on the site. Well, Coleman Sharp here had basically had an argument with his wife, a lot of noise, things got quiet. I think he left. And so anyway, the, the guards, you know, were called because of all the noise and they discovered his wife, uh, throat was slashed and so forth. So they apprehended him. And he ended up saying it was suicide, which the guards were, you know, very just because that's essentially it was a very, you know, there's no way someone could do that themselves. So I just kind of found it interesting. I'm actually still studying this one. Um, and it appeared in a couple of uh, issues of the of the journal, as well as the as some of the Knoxville newspapers. And um, I'm not going to reveal the whole story because I'm kind of still working on it. And it, it'll probably be in my next webinar at the library in October. <clears throat> but but Sharp ended up um, the fight was evidently over a dog. She uh, the, his wife got a dog. They had a volatile relationship. They'd only been married a couple of years. But it's just kind of a strange phenomenon to me that a murder took place. You know, of course, the irony, Happy Valley and so forth. But, um, the, the, uh, you know, contrast there. Um, but yeah, so that so it went on to the to the Supreme Court and it, it has kind of an interesting twist to the to the ending of the case. Um, so that's just one of those early early uh, tidbits I found in, in a newspaper that kind of this, this actually prompted me to really read the newspapers more closely to see what other things had, had maybe been kind of overlooked. And another thing, um, a lot of you may be familiar with Lewis Sloten. Uh, you know, he was a, he was a physicist uh, and a chemist essentially who worked in nuclear criticality safety and also assembling weapons uh, at the beginning of the man, some of the first, uh, the first nuclear weapons. Um, so I won't go into all the details on this, but just to give a little backstory on him uh, that kind of he's known for what he's besides being a, you know, a brilliant scientist was, um, you know, he was performing an experiment 
one afternoon um, showing the first steps of how fission works using two half spheres of beryllium. Well, this was a, there was a three inch core of plutonium. And, you know, he was showing that basically if these, if this sphere comes together, then you have a criticality. And this was the same core that had been used less than a year earlier by Harry Daglian, who had suffer, suffered a fatal exposure, fatal radiation exposure, uh, doing some, maybe a similar experiment. I'm not hundred percent sure, but at, but at 320 on, on, on this May afternoon, there were seven other scientists watching in the room and Sloten was doing this experiment. We had a, a big screwdriver that was keeping the spheres apart. And of course he had no intentions of actually creating a, a criticality, but the screwdriver slipped and the, the spheres came together and it caused a critical reaction. The scientists saw that dreaded blue flash and felt a wave of heat and all of them got a, a very high dose of radiation. Several of the people in the front row would die from you know, radiation exposure related cancers years later. Sloten uh, received a much larger dose uh, and suffered a very you know, painful side effects and died nine days later. So it was a very high profile um, uh, situation there. He, this kind of shows a little diagram of how far apart the scientists were and almost like that, just, as you would think, you know, the closer ones got a higher dose and those, those uh, one man, I think outlived the, the rest of them, but um, some of them got some, some pretty nasty cancers uh, and died in their, I think in their forties and fifties. So the, the tie to Oak Ridge with this is um, when, when I worked in records at K25, I found a piece of correspondence that had Sloten's signature on it. And he had visited here and I thought it was very notable. Um, at that point, we didn't really, I didn't, wasn't aware that he had worked here quite a bit. I'd heard stories about him, his visits, but he uh, wrote a letter to uh, Dr. Hull, who, who was another scientist here, thanking him for, you know, the time, uh, the courtesies he, he gave him. But what was interesting is the, the note, the letter was just two weeks before this event. So two weeks before this happened, he had been in Oak Ridge, um, you know, he talked about working at, at, at X10 with uh, Dr. Hall. So then more recently, um, I've also found a, uh, a dormitory. Well, excuse, uh, excuse me, Mike. Well, yes. Be before you leave Sloten, let me add a couple of yeah. things too. Sure. Uh, first, the building out at Los Alamos where, uh, where he uh, actually cr did this tickling the tail of the dragon experiment yeah. that that he his screwdriver slipped and he had to reach in and pull out the pull the spheres apart. He uh, uh, that building is now a part of the Manhattan Project National Historical Park. Uh, I've been in yeah. the building. Uh, I've gone through all of the park facilities at Los Alamos. It's it's on the site, so it's not accessible to the public just yet. But at some point, it will be. And it is included in, in the National Park, much as here at Oak Ridge, we've got Beta 3, the building that has the Calutrons in, in Y-12, that's a part of the park, as well as Building 9731, which is the uh, first building completed at Y-12 and still has Alpha Calutron magnets in it, the only ones in the world. And of course, the Graphite Reactor. Graphite Reactor is accessible to the public through the uh, DOE public tours, which we hope to start back up in March of next year. Uh, we also are hoping to get 9731 uh, available by tours this next year, but beta three will be several years before we get that. Now, one other story about Sloten, while he was here in Oak Ridge, he had an experiment going on at the graphite reactor and part of his experiment was uh, after the reactor had finished doing what it did and whatever, they, they dumped that material out into a water trough. And because that experiment, there was something wrong with it that I, I don't know the details exactly. But, but in order to get to the experiment, they needed to shut the reactor down before you went in there but they didn't want to shut it down. I mean, it was going and they needed to keep it going. So Sloten actually took his dosimeter off and went in the water himself, pulled out his experiment. And that kind of gives you some insight into the, uh, the character of the man. He took more risks than he should have 
obviously. Yeah. And as a result, uh, he took, he, he lost his life. Just an additional tidbit. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I'd always heard that, um, that same story and that, I guess, I think Martin Whitaker, you know, the, the lab director mm -hmm. at the time was sort of taken aback, you know, and, and several, even before I really knew too much about Sloton, that was one of those little, the old timers would talk about how that they, you know, more or less thought he was kind of crazy for jumping in the water there into the, into the reactor pool. So, yeah. Um, and, and, oh yeah, the, the, and basically the, the other tie, which is a more recent discovery at the library was um, I had been looking for dormitory records for a long time and they're not, there's not like a huge amount. Uh, it looks like, and, and they're from 43 and he actually lived in it or had a dormitory here. He's assigned um, one of the, to one of the dormitories. So he was here, um, you know, working in 43. And I guess I didn't realize that he, had spent quite as much time, um, you know, as an actual Oak Ridger, I guess, uh, during the early part of the war. So yeah, it's, uh, Sloten's kind of an interesting, an interesting person. Um, and one more thing, I guess that I don't know if any of you have ever seen the uh, the movie Fat Man and Little Boy with Paul Newman. It sort of recreates the idea. It's kind of a hybrid of Sloten and and Dagley and the other guy. Uh, portrayed yeah. in the movie and it kind of shows the guy getting exposed and so forth that was based i guess more strongly on sloten um the, the paul, paul newman <laughs> plays general groves kind of a maybe a stretch but he actually gains weight and grows the mustache and sort of pulls it off um oops okay so another one which is a, a little bit of a, a teaser i guess to something i'm also working on is this uh, it was a bank theft in Oak Ridge, and you know, when I first read about this in the in the papers, similarly to uh, oops, getting ahead of myself. Um, let's see, and 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 I guess it was 1945 um, before the bomb dropped. Actually, in a um, couple months before the bomb dropped, you know, super security, uh, plain clothes security, and the guards, and the police, and everything were right up there in Jackson Square at Hamilton Bank. Um, there was a Stone and Webster accountant uh, named Clyde Bales. And I had seen this headline and it says, you know, bank, uh, ro uh, you know, it wasn't a bank robbery, sort of like an, an embezzlement, I guess, but right there under the noses of, of the people in the bank, he took $5,000. Um, and what it, I guess what had occurred was he was a Stone and Webster employee and an accountant. And um, he was responsible for, I guess, a lot of the money that was used for expenses for the town. Um, even the the ward the bond drives and the, you know the money that people would 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 donate for for war bonds, as well as other expenses around town. So he had access to thirty to forty thousand dollars a month in in a lot of cash. He was responsible for the accounting part of this, and so basically he dipped into the till and, and it was taking money, and then he he, he took five thousand dollars out of an account and paid himself back. And I guess at the end of the day, it was discovered this money was missing. Uh, and he acted alone. I mean, as far as Stone and Webster uh, didn't, you know, bear any responsibility other than he was an employee. So that one I'm still investigating. And it also has a, a case, uh, I guess, for the FBI and all that. And I'm waiting on the on the case to try to find out a bit more about that. But I was, just thought it was kind of interesting that that happened, you know, right, right in the middle of the, the tight security and all. And I've been doing these... Um, I guess I'll call them totally useless trivia kind of things. But another newspaper discovery was I had discovered that that Fred Astaire came through here. Of course, this was well after the war. This was in in 54, 1954. Um, he had some there was a person by the last name of, of Twig that lived in and they lived in Knoxville, but had worked here in Oak Ridge. And, and, and the lady had been a a dancer and an actress and stuff and knew Fred Astaire. And her, she and her husband were friends with him. And he came to Knoxville to, to visit. And said, you know, they said, do you want to see Oak Ridge? And, and he said, well, sure. He had heard about it. And he, so he took a little Oak Ridge tour. He didn't really want to be seen. So it was sort of like a secret tour in a, uh, I think uh, they, they took a, 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 a station wagon and they just drove around town, kind of showed him the sites. They ate at the Mayflower restaurant and it, and it said they ate breakfast at um, somewhere else in Jackson Square and actually made two trips. He, he, spent part of the day, went back to Knoxville and, and stayed there, came back into town. He was, he was actually spotted a couple of times and recognized. And um, he signed a few autographs, but he, he really was trying to be low key. So 
when they uh, put this in the paper, you know, the secret secret visit from from Fred Astaire, which I just thought was kind of fun. Uh, sort of amusing little side note. Um, so yeah, I'm working on um, my next webinar uh, for the library. It'll be October 20th. And I'm kind of, something I've sort of always wanted to do is focus on um, sort of lesser known facts. Uh, let's see, I'm gonna do this and go back to uh, here. And, uh, you know, just little things I've discovered. And, and a lot of it, like I said, is based on, on newspaper uh, accounts and newspaper discoveries one but i'm gonna these particular ones i've shown i want to show those in a little more detail uh, a little more a little more of a full story and probably do a, a series of those things my uh, had recently done the, the oracle class on on uh, how to use the oak ridge room kind of a tutorial and i had mentioned in, in there that i was gonna highlight some of my discoveries and things that you could find in the oak ridge room um you know there's just such so much information there that i think anyone with a lot of curiosity and a little bit of determination could probably find things that I've overlooked. Um, you know, there's so many different stories and so many different scientists and things like that in there. Um, you know, as I've mentioned, uh, gosh, you know, records of, of spies, you know, we have like Alfred Slack, uh, the spy from Y12. We have his, his uh, wife's library card record where she applied for a library card and that, and as I mentioned, I think in, the, in that previous class that they, they lived at, on Vermont Avenue, and that gave me the exact address. It was 80 Vermont, which I think, you know, doesn't exist anymore. It was an e-building over there about where Burger King is. Um, so anyhow, yeah, those are going to be the things, the kind of things I want to try to highlight. And I think I've got some, you know, hidden stories and, and I've got, and in my, not unlike Fred Astaire, I've got my useless, <laughs> no, fun trivia, you know, that uh, I'm going to also highlight. But yeah, Ray, I guess that's about all I've got. Next time, okay. maybe my Google Slides will uh, will work. <laughs> not, not, not to worry. It, anyone have any questions for uh, for Mike before before we move on? Any any questions? Yes. Uh, what happened? <clears throat> what happened to George Koval? Well, George Koval, to my knowledge, now I'll confess. I haven't read Ann's book yet. <laughs> I've got a copy of it. And uh, Ray, Ray pointed out, Ray sent me an email and, and I was, I was on page 211 as a, as a credit. So I thought that that's my, I guess that's my first book uh, uh, credit that I wasn't even aware of. I'm, I, I couldn't remember how I had, uh, uh, <laughs> cause I'm not sure when she started working on the book, but yeah, um, he, I can say, and Ray might be able to comment more on that than as far as I know, he, you know, he, he got through unscathed and, you know, I don't think he was ever, like a lot of, you know, several of the other spies got arrested in 1950, you know, Fuchs and Slack and, and Harry Gold and a lot of those guys got arrested around the same time. But Koval, you know, he, uh, he never, he never was uh, really uh, highlighted until after he was gone. So, yeah, let me, let me add a little bit. I, uh, Ann and I had contact when she was writing the book. Uh, I was pleased to be able to help her some man. I think I probably steered her toward my, but at, at any rate, uh, I have the book, we have read the book, and uh, I have also written about George Koval. It's in, uh, historically speaking, on, on my archives. It's, we published it in the Oak Ridger. Uh, of course, since her book has come out, there's a, a, a increased interest in him. I had a Russian uh, travel writer who came to town, uh, the, his last name is Dimitri, first name is Alexia. And Alexia was uh, very interested in George Koval. So being a Russian, he could, he could get more information than I could. He actually went to some of the uh, KGB records in, uh, in, in Russia and did some research into what happened to Koval after he got back from uh, his spying efforts in, in the States. He, as, uh, as Mike said, he was born in Iowa, so he, he was a U.S. citizen. And they went back to Russia, his family did, and uh, he was recruited there after going to college there. He was recruited by the KGB and sent back to the United States. 
the interesting thing is the way he got one interesting thing is the way he got into the states without having to go through customs is that he became friends with the captain of the boat that he was on coming back to uh, coming in, I think through uh, San Francisco or San Diego one coming in through California. And he actually walked off of the boat into the city with the captain of the boat. And uh, that, that way he didn't, he, he was not suspiciously entering and he, he was able to come right on in. Uh, he was in, I believe in New York City after the war and became concerned about uh, when, uh, remember when they started finding these spies, there was a lot of the Goldbergs and others, there was a lot of, a lot of turmoil and he got out of the States and went back to Russia. He did get a job in a, uh, as a professor, but he was frustrated in that he never received any recognition during his life other than, and he didn't feel like he was being treated well in Russia. He didn't get recognition. He didn't get opportunities. He was stuck in that teaching position for the rest of his career. And, uh, and, and there was another person, uh, a person who was involved in the uh, accident up in Philadelphia that had the uh, steam release that had to do with the research on thermal diffusion. His name was Karmish. Last name, I believe, is Karmish. And he... <laughs> So he uh, was his first name George too. Is it Arnold? Arnold. Arnold. You're yeah. right. You're right. Yeah. Arnold. Arnold Carmish, and he made contact with uh, George Coble late in Coble's life. They exchanged letters and interacted with one another, and he he learned more about uh, Coble's life, and that they had they had been had been in contact while Coble was here during the. Uh, the Manhattan Project. So that's another connection that that played out over his life. But uh, those are some of the things that that I'm aware of that had to do with George Coble. While he was here in Oak Ridge, he uh, evidently had access to enough of the sites in Oak Ridge that he knew the difficulty associated with uh, separating the uranium-235. He also went to Dayton, Ohio, where he learned about the uh, polonium being produced there for the uh, initiator for the, for the plutonium bomb. And I'm convinced that with Klaus Fuchs's uh, plans to Fat Man that he gave to the Russians before we ever used Fat Man or ever even exploded the gadget. And that combined with the information that George Coble provided, which was how difficult it was to get uranium separated, the whole process taking place here in Oak Ridge, and with support from across the nation in, other, in many other ways. I'm convinced that, that those two bits of information caused the Russians to go in the direction they did to produce a bomb as quickly as they did uh, using the fat man design and, and avoiding the difficulty of, of separating uranium-235. So Koval's information, I think, was very instrumental in what the Russians did, along with Klaus Fuchs' information. Any other questions for mine? All right. Well, Mike, we're glad that you were with us this morning and thank you for sharing that information that you shared, okay? Thank you. You can, uh, you can obviously stay with us as long as you want or you can, uh, you can check out and go do something else, okay? Okay. Thanks, yeah, a, lot. Do, thanks a lot, Ray. Thank you. All right. So let me pick up uh, any other questions about anything that you'd like me to address before I start moving on to a few of the other points I want to make today. Any questions, just uh, either put them in the chat or, or 
unmute yourself and, and ask your question, okay? Hey, Ray. Yeah. Uh, I will say as a, as, a, as a relevant side note to that, um, it, with Koval, you know, I, I looked for such a long time for any kind of trace of him, right? And I, and I also did with, with uh, David Greenglass, which I guess, you know, David Greenglass is fairly well known. And so um, because Greenglass was a military person, you know, he didn't have like a payroll record for, you know, carbide or what, whoever, you know. So um, after years and years and years of looking for the name, um, Recently, he had he had a library card. <laughs> in nineteen, yeah, in nineteen forty five, he was one of those. There, there's a list of, and it's a little sensitive. The library card, it's like you know, I can't get away from sensitive things. You know, you go from DOE to the library, but library <laughs> records are. We're, we're working on the retention period. I guess it's like you know, with certain things have a seventy five year, but the nineteen, it's actually the nineteen forty four library cards, and most of the people are deceased and so forth, but you know, there's no records of the checkouts or anything like that. It's just their address and their name. But um, David Greenglass is listed. I remember I was kind of excited because I'd always looked everywhere for any kind of document because like I never could find any trace of him having been here. But he had a library card. And I think he was a private and it just says private David Greenglass. Uh, it lists him in a in a barracks, you know. So anyway, that's just another another spy. Uh, the spies are, can be elusive, you know. Uh, that's true. Well, speaking of names that you find in various locations, like I know you're always looking for them and, and you tend to find them in some of the most unusual yeah. places. Uh, you're familiar with, and I think you and I have talked about this and I, many others maybe as well, but you're familiar that we have Lee Harvey Oswald listed yeah. as having visited the uh, American Museum of Science and Energy. Actually, yeah. it was the it was actually the Atomic Energy uh, Museum of Atomic Energy at the time. But uh, I, I, the reason I thought of that is I had a fellow that uh, sent me that photograph of that page yeah. just within the last few weeks. He had found it in some of his material and sent it to me. So it's well, interesting what names show up. You know, being a, um, a genuine amateur expert on handwriting analysis, Sure looks authentic to me. <laughs> I mean, I see. Well, good. I'll, I'll, I don't know. I'll, I'll, I'll quote you on that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks again, Mike. Thank you, Ray. Thanks. All right. If there are no other questions on any other subject, then let me move into a couple of things that I want to share with you today. Uh, This is the one story of the UK 33 would be of interest. I'm sorry, you need to say that again. The story of the U-233 would be of interest. Okay, the story of the U-233. Uh, you know that they are cleaning that out now as we speak. Yeah, why, why are they wasting such a good resource. <laughs> it's not being wasted. Some of it is being used. Uh, and I, I have some information on that, that I will pull together and share with you at our third session. I thank you for bringing that up. Oh, no, no, no. Quit. Okay. I thank you for bringing that up. And I will give more detail at uh, next week. Uh, but let me say this, that material, they know exactly where it is. They know exactly where it's going and it is not being done away with. In other words, it is being moved from here, but we will have access to it if we decide to do more with it in the future. And some things are being done with it right now. And I'll, I'll share the most recent information with you next week. Okay. A any other questions or anything else you want me to research and bring back next week that I don't have right in front of me just now. Okay. All right. Let's see what I can show you here. I need to go here and share that. And I'm hoping you're seeing Mike and we'll move on from him. I, I want you to see some of the uh, interior of the, of the uh, Oak Ridge History Museum. 
I'm so proud of what we have there at the Midtown Community Center. This is uh, uh, Don Honeycutt talking to a group in one of the rooms there in the main part of the uh, of the museum. Uh, it's a group that I brought through. Uh, and in fact, I've got another group that I'm taking through as soon as I finish here this morning. Uh, and this group that I'm taking is the niece of Colonel Nichols. And I'm gonna take her up and show her where Nichols house was up on Olney Lane. And uh, then we're gonna go through through the uh, museum there in, uh, at the uh, Midtown Community Center. And there's a really good exhibit there of Ed Westcott. Uh, those are awards that Ed has received and some of his photographs. So uh, again, that museum is, is a highlight of the, uh, of the tours that I provide to people who are coming into town. And then, uh, of course, my good buddy Bill Wilcox is featured at the uh, K-25 History Center. Uh, this is people coming into the History Center that I provided a tour for. Uh, these are teachers from all across, high school teachers from all across the state brought in here by Bill Carey. That's Bill standing there in the middle of the group. And... Uh, he brought this, this group of teachers through and we took them through the K-25 History Museum. It has more artifacts than any other museum I've seen lately. And of course there's the replica of Little Boy. And uh, other exhibits that are there that has a really good timeline that uh, shows the history of gaseous diffusion. <clears throat> now, I'm gonna, now I'm gonna move to a more current issue. These, this is what's actually taking place. This is at Y-12, where a new fire station is being constructed, uh, began in April and an emergency operations center began in February. Those are being constructed on the Y-12 site as we speak. Uh, they also took down the biology complex and uh, it will be uh, now this, this is the West End Protected Area Reduction Project where they're splitting the, the perimeter intrusion and detection system in half to uh, gain access to some of the larger buildings for demolition. Now, I wanna talk to you about the training center that's going out on the west end of town. You asked me about that last time, I think, about what construction's going on out there. And uh, it's a federal state funded partnership of uh, a demonstration and training facilities for nuclear non-proliferation, emergency and security. And uh, it's, they'll be able to train experts in non-proliferation, those areas. It's, uh, there are three actual, three facilities going in out there, the emergency response training facility the simulated nuclear and radiological activities facility and the science and energy education meeting center. Now, the, those two, the top two, I'm gonna show you in more detail. And uh, these are out on the west end of the town going out toward K-25 on the south side of the road. And uh, this is where they're located. The two white diagrams show you the location. And uh, the first one is uh, simulated nuclear and radiological activities facility is here on the left. And then on the right is the emergency response training facility. And these are artist drawings of what they, uh, what they are intended to look like. That's the emergency response training facility. Here are the actual 
drawings that show the location along the side of the road that's going out. And the facilities. This is some of the work that was being done out there the, to uh, prepare the site. And that's the uh, simulated nuclear and radiological facility intended to go out there. Now this gives you a little bit more detail. The, uh, these three are here. And then notice that this, this particular future transportation security and driving track, uh, that's gonna be located down here on Bear Creek Road where the uh, training facility is, central training facility is now. The other three locations are up here. Now this particular one, the City of Oak Ridge Science and Energy Education Meeting Center, that was planned to go in right beside the American Museum of Science and Energy. I believe they've run into a roadblock on that with Realty Link. I don't know enough details to be specific about what's going on. I just know that there's been discussion about that. And the most recent information I have indicates that they've come to a standstill and are not able to proceed. So I don't know any good information to give you about what's happening with that facility other than I don't believe it's proceeding as well as we had hoped. And that's a disappointment. Now there's another facility on the west end of town that I want to feature for you here today. That's the Overlook, the K-25 Overlook. Uh, it's in private hands now, that whole Happy Valley area that Mike mentioned about the murder. That, uh, that whole area has been purchased and uh, it, by a private individual and he has refurbished that history center that or that uh, uh overlook uh, some of the things that you see on the inside are things that other things in oak ridge that you can go to uh, the map shows where where they where it's located and and the whole area and then there's a a, a poster about the manhattan project there's one about Happy Valley that talks about uh, what uh, what's out what was out there. Some of Ed Westcott's photographs, of course, and then uh, talks a little about the women that came to the came to the Clinton Engineer Works and uh, forever altered the course of human history simply by showing up and doing their jobs. There was a big transition taking place during the war as most of the young men were in the military, but the young women, as you know, even the young girls right out of high school were being hired to run the Calutrons at Y-12. So there was a lot of uh, involvement uh, of women in the, uh, in, in the workforce at the time. Now I'm changing, changing directions again with you here. This one is something that's happening to tomorrow. And this is the Hermes information session that's scheduled. It's a public information session to provide introduction to the Kairos power. This is the small modular reactor that's being built out at the East Tennessee Technology Park, actually on the old K-33 building site. And this is going to be an overview of it, an a virtual open house, question and answer session. And it's tomorrow at 6 p.m. Uh, and here's the location to register for it. It's just kairospower.com slash Tennessee slash. So that, that is the connection. If you wanna make a note of that, that's how you can go and register for a Zoom session. Uh, that'll be on tomorrow night at 6 p.m. No, can't do it. So I'm gonna 
put this in the chat for you. K A O S power. All right. If you want to copy that out of the chess chat, that will give you the access to the. I hope I spelled it right. Okay, it looks good to me. If you'll copy that, you'll be able to register for the session that's coming on uh, tomorrow. Now. All right. All right, now we have just a few more minutes to wrap up before the end of the session. And uh, so I'd like to have some discussion with you about anything that you want to ask a question about now or anything that you'd like for me to include in our final session coming up next Monday. I will get the uh, U233 presentation information for you. What else would you like to have included? Are the houses that are going on the site of the MZ particularly energy efficient? If not, why not? You'll have to say that again for me. The houses that are going up in the site of the old MZ, are they particularly energy efficient? If not, uh, why aren't they made samples for energy efficiency? I, I understand your question now, thank you. And my answer is going to have to be, I don't have a clue. I don't know anything about that uh, apartment complex. I will ask a question about it and see if I can get some information for you next week. But I, I don't know the situation there. I would hope like you that they would use the latest technologies. A but I'll, look, I'll let you know. A casual look at them doesn't show any anything particularly. As a matter of fact, they're going to some old methods. I, I, I appreciate what you're saying. I've not paid attention that much to it. I, I have obviously seen the constructions going on there, but I've not paid any attention to that kind of detail. I will, I, I will check into it, though, and try to give you some information by next week. It's Anything else? Yeah, I understand. Anything else from anyone else? Yeah, I, I have read about atomic spies who went back to Russia. Uh, not only atomic spies, other spies who spied for Russia and after they uh, were discovered or even before they were discovered, they went back to Russia thinking they would get a hero's welcome. As you mentioned, George Koval didn't get any recognition until very recently, and of course he's no longer alive, I imagine. Uh, but uh, Klaus Fuchs, I think, was different. Klaus Fuchs didn't go, go to Russia. He went to East Germany, and he became the head of a research institute and did, um, uh, did research uh, uh, and had a distinguished research career afterward. But I believe he took care not to go back to the Soviet Union. I think you're exactly right. He did, in fact, get a 14-year prison term. He was a British citizen, and he did get a, uh, a prison term. He served nine years of that 14 years before getting out, and he also provided the plans of Fat Man to China. 
I, I really don't know enough. I mean, I have the book that Mike talked about, The Atomic Spy. It's a good book. I've, I've looked through it and, and read some parts of it. I still don't fully understand Klaus Fuchs and his, uh, his intentions. I, I, I don't know, but what it was a fear of any one nation having information that others didn't have, but I can't, I just can't get into his uh, thinking enough to appreciate the rationale. George Koval, he was loyal to the Russians and, and he did, he, he, he did that. Uh, he, uh, he, because of his loyalty to Russia. Others, the green glasses, uh, uh, Rosenbergs, uh, money was involved in, in some of those activities. Uh, the, uh, but I don't, I don't know about enough about Klaus to, to be able to, to know why he, uh, what his uh, motivation was. I wish these things would stay away while I'm doing this. A any other questions? No. Any other thoughts before we end up? Okay. I'll uh, prepare those comments about the departments and U233 and be ready to share those with you at our, at our next uh, opportunity next Monday. And we will have uh, Alan Lowe will be our guest and uh, he will talk to us about what's going on at, at the American Museum of Science and Energy and what I'm hoping that I can get him to focus some on the future of what he anticipates and talk to us about, uh, about new exhibits that are coming there. All right. Thank you. Thank you okay. very much. Thank you. Thank you. Also, thank you all so much for your patience when we were trying to get Mike connected up and get him to share his screen. Uh, again, I do post these as a video on YouTube and, and I'll cut all that out. So if you share it with your friends or if you go look for it yourself, you won't have to sit through that, that dead time again. But I do appreciate it. Uh, thank you very much. And I'll see you uh, next Monday.